Welcome to Trial Site News Weekly Roundup. Today for this episode, we'll be talking about a top doctor at University of Hong Kong who suggests aggressively treating COVID-19 patients early with antiviral cocktail medications. Then reports out of Ireland that Pfizer BioNTech's BNT 162B2 is very close to FDA and EMA EUA. Then India's ICMR excludes ivermectin from national guidelines for COVID-19. Not sufficient evidence via randomized controlled trials. And finally, Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research breakthrough on how to treat COVID-19 cytokine storm. From Trial Site News, I'm Adrian, and the Weekly Roundup starts now. Hong Kong's medical community knows something about coronaviruses, given its experience with the first SARS 17 years ago, and of course, the most recent SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. The top pandemic doctor there from University of Hong Kong suggests a path forward to keep COVID-19 patients out of intensive care, where the probability of death rises significantly. Stop them from entering in the first place by taking far more proactive measures once an individual is in fact infected. This top doctor emphasizes early and aggressive hospitalization and treatment in a bid to minimize disease escalation and mortality. Now, his approach may be working as, according to a recent Bloomberg report, the COVID-19 death rate in Hong Kong is at 2%, well below the worldwide average. So how is this doctor's approach different to those in Britain or here in the United States? Well, according to the doctor, when talking to Bloomberg, he said that in places like the UK or the US, usually if you have mild symptoms, you are not admitted to a hospital at all. You just wait at home until you feel very bad or you have the shortness of breath. And this is quite different than the approach they are taking in Hong Kong, where they admit most people testing positive so they can be treated immediately and aggressively. So the doctor was asked, why do they take this aggressive approach in Hong Kong? He said that the top infectious disease provider shared that first and foremost, the transmission of the coronavirus is greatly reduced in the community. It may seem more draconian that mild COVID-19 cases are hospitalized and isolated, but it certainly made a difference in the total volume of cases and death rates. Moreover, with a huge number of clinical trials with potential treatments, the number of hospitalized patients affords a chance for more robust matching of patients to clinical trials. Patients can receive targeted advanced investigational treatments immediately as the infections start to worsen. So why is this important? Bloomberg's Gale wrote that according to the doctor, the amount of SARS-CoV-2 virus or viral load accumulated in patients peaks at this point, the time the symptoms appear. So what are some treatments that Hong Kong team uses? Although recently shown not effective, the University of Hong Kong suggests that the use of the antivirals, lopinavir and ritonavir, can work. The doctor suggests that he wasn't surprised by the recent World Health Organization findings because the drugs were not given right upon infection onset. He told Bloomberg that, we know that one drug is not good because all of these are very modestly active. We need early cocktail therapy to get good results. Hence, the combination to COVID-19 patients in the first week of disease onset reduces the duration of the illness by six days and shortens the hospitalization period by a week based on a study back in May. So interferon, part of the Hong Kong cocktail, evidences potential efficacy against COVID-19. In fact, Bloomberg reported that based on its interview with the Hong Kong top doctor, the early use of interferon, at least in some patients, may help combat the virus and reduce death rates. For example, recent clinical trials published in Journal Science revealed that approximately 14% of patients with critical SARS-CoV-2 infections have inadequate levels of interferon, which is required for immune system defense against viral pathogens. Trial Site News has chronicled a few studies suggesting the importance of interferon as a potential treatment. To read the article in its entirety, follow the link in the description below. 
Reports out of Ireland suggest that the first COVID-19 vaccine out of the West could be available in Ireland in literally just a matter of weeks. Known as BTN162B2, this mRNA-based vaccine was originally developed by the German biotech known as BioNTech and now is associated with Pfizer as the giant American pharmaceutical company entered into a co-development and commercialization arrangement with the company. Ironically, as trial site news has reported, the Pfizer and BioNTech team didn't accept U.S. federal money from Operation Warp Speed to subsidize clinical development. Yet they appear on track to be first in the vaccine race in the West. Now, Pfizer Ireland has revealed to local media that the company could potentially be in the position to receive an emergency use authorization within weeks. This would trigger the start of what would be an unprecedented effort to start the distribution process involving 100 million doses before the end of 2020. The vaccine candidate has been tested on 35,000 people thus far with no reports of any adverse side effects. The, the country manager of Pfizer shared that they were moving at a breakneck speed to make it to the finish line and in the process served to lift the nation's spirits as the country endures six weeks of lockdown. If the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the European Medicines Agency approve emergency use authorizations by the end of October to early November, it would be possible to start inoculating people before the end of the year. Ultimately, the regulators on both sides of the pond, so to speak, will demand quality data-driven evidence for any EUA. Mr. Reed shared that the FDA will review the data with their own scientists. It will be reviewed by an external panel of independent experts at a publicly held meeting. And Pfizer is going to have to demonstrate the quality and consistency of the vaccine. Now, for this next story, although some Indian states, such as Uttar Pradesh, allow for the use of ivermectin off-label as a treatment option as well as a prophylaxis for COVID-19, sources recently shared with Indian media that the Indian Council of Medical Research, National Task Force for COVID-19, and the Joint Monitoring Group recently held a meeting to determine if the drug would be included in the Health Ministry's clinical management protocol for COVID-19. And it looks like it will not. Ivermectin is approved by Indian authorities for indication against parasites, such as scabies and intestinal parasites, as in the case here in the United States. Now, the relatively safe and cheap drug has been embraced in many nations as a treatment for COVID-19. As we've reported, Intra started after a Monash University lab demonstrated in vitro that Ivermectin zapped the SARS-CoV-2 within 48 hours. And after a number of case series efforts in various primarily developing nations occurred from Bangladesh to Peru and even here in the United States, trial site news has been at the forefront reporting on these unfolding hospital protocols, observational studies, and even a couple of randomized controlled trials. Now, we have chronicled extensive use in select Indian states. However, as I mentioned, the health ministry sources recently shared in the Hindustan Times said that following deliberations, experts decided not to include ivermectin in, an, in the national clinical management protocol for COVID-19 because of lack of sufficient evidence on its efficacy based on randomized trials held in India and abroad. Now, we've talked about a number of these observational studies uh, like ICON involving ivermectin in addition to at least two randomized controlled studies and one in the Middle East. The general tendency, however, among national regulatory and research authorities is to demand for more extensive, more comprehensive randomized controlled trials. However, the local media reminded their readers that remdesivir is allowed by the Health Ministry for Restricted Emergency Use Purposes in moderate cases under investigational therapies in the nation's clinical management protocol for COVID-19. Now, we want to note here that the ministry has also given the thumbs up for tocilizumab, even though the randomized controlled trials demonstrates no efficacy. In fact, trial site news just reported that the U.S. is not including this IL-6 inhibitor in its national guidelines for that very reason. India is accepting hydroxychloroquine for early course disease treatment, but not for critically ill patients. They are accepting dexamethasone for those COVID-19 patients in the moderate to severe stage, which differs then here in America, which follows the recovery trial recommendation, which means only in more severe cases where hospitalized patients also need breathing assistance via ventilator or other mechanical support. Now, we should note that nothing was mentioned about favipiravir, which is now approved in India, at least on a provisional basis during the COVID-19 pandemic, as evidenced by several generic versions of the drug for COVID-19. Some patients' immune systems have responded to SARS-CoV-2 infections by going into a form of overdrive, leading to the overzealous response known as cytokine storm, which is a very dangerous situation. 
Now, when this occurs, the death rate associated with COVID-19 is extremely high. In association with this condition, the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research and Northwell COVID-19 Research Consortium completed a retrospective study of 6,000 patients. And the findings led to somewhat of a potential breakthrough in that the results point to the most effective immunomodulatory therapies to treat patients with evidence of this cytokine storm and, importantly, improve the patient's survival. Now, led by a pulmonary and critical care physician and associate professor at the Feinstein Institutes, a multidisciplinary team of investigators analyzed the electronic health records of hospitalized COVID-19 patients across 12 of Northwell Health's hospitals between March 1st and April 24th of this year. The results were published this week in CHEST. Now, the patients were divided into one or six groups. These groups were no immunomodulatory treatment, patients who received an intravenous corticosteroids, anti-interleukin-6 antibody therapy, like, like tocilizumab, or anti-interleukin-1 therapy, alone or in combination with corticosteroids. Now, the results show that the most effective treatment was the combination of corticosteroids, such as dexamethasone, with tocilizumab when compared to a standard of care. Now, additionally, there was an improvement if corticosteroids were used alone or in combination with tocilizumab, or anakinra, when compared with standard of care. Now, overall, there were twice as many males as females in the cohorts, and more than 65% had never smoked. Contradictory to previous reports, the black population was associated with better survival compared to white patients. Additionally, the most common comorbidities across the group of patients that experienced a cytokine storm included hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, cancer, and then asthma. Now, the doctor's major COVID-19 research study gives timely and crucial new knowledge about using currently available anti-inflammatory drugs, according to Kevin Tracy, president and CEO of the Feinstein Institutes. He said that this information will help save lives. The researchers hope that the findings are useful for frontline providers to care for severely ill COVID-19 patients and to aid in the future design of large, randomized, controlled clinical trials, the gold standard of medical research. Now, we'd like to note that when establishing medical evidence, randomized controlled blinded studies represent the strongest form of evidence, which is why the medical establishment will place the highest weight on well-designed randomized controlled studies. The randomized controlled trial produces the highest level of evidence for causality. However, there are issues that can impact the findings of both randomized controlled studies and retrospective studies. A retrospective study, which is a form of observational study such as this, while not randomized controlled trial, does introduce important real-world data and cannot be ignored. They are often the next best approach to address the limitations of randomized controlled trials, especially during things like a pandemic. For more on the importance of well-designed observational studies, check out the link in the description below. And that, my friends, brings this episode to a close. As always, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again next time.